Thank you, Kelly. Uh, very perceptive comments that we all need to embody in our future work. So thank you. Uh, Mary, I wonder if you could say a few words about the future of the communication working group, just to set the scene for the questions that I'm sure will follow. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Mary Short. I'm a senior research advisor in our pediatric capabilities group at Eli Lilly and Company. And uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, Jennifer and Christina for their leadership of the INC communication group. And from the onset, they had <clears throat> all stakeholders involved, and that has been consistent. Uh, so in the beginning of uh, 2020, the committee chair leadership will change to Dr. Kelly Wade and myself. And we're going to build upon that work um, that was established by Jennifer in Christina and make sure that we have good representation from parents and from nurses and physicians as we're all really partners in this effort to be able to uh, effectively study medications and bring new therapies for neonates. So and it, we um, have been told that Christina and Jennifer will continue to work with us, just not as the chairs. And this committee um, has been very active and as you've seen, um, they have five ongoing manuscripts under development in addition to the webinar. So it is a great team, and we look for others who have this interest to take this information that we've gotten from our survey and take them into action items moving forward. So we are looking for others to participate as well. So thank you, Mark, for letting me um, make those few comments. Great. Well, thank you, Mary. And it it's good to see that such inspirational leadership from the outset of this group is is being applied and will continue with with the new the new leaders who I'm sure will bring the same the same spirit and energy so thank you very much to all the commentators from the panel at the moment I've got four questions for Jennifer and one question for everybody else or well, one question including Jennifer so do people want to put some more questions in um, so that Jennifer gets a break from asking, answering all these questions? Again, please use the small, small dots to go to Q&A and then um, type in your question. And while, oh, here we go. Yes, um, use, use this facility here. At least one person has, has done it, um, in addition to some of the questions we had from the previous meeting. So the system's all working. and um, Please send some questions. While everybody's thinking, um, I'd just like to draw out a little bit more from Jennifer about her thoughts on how parent graduates can contribute to educating and supporting uh, current parents on NICUs, both for um, in general, but also for how graduate parents can contribute to improve communication between the three stakeholder groups that we have. So Jennifer, what are your thoughts on parent graduate education? Well, thank you, Mark. Um, I have a lot of thoughts, but I think in general that NICU graduate parents can be a real asset to the researchers and the hospital staff. You know, they can be included in planning process and certainly be used to review the language that is spoken to parents upon asking for consent or even language that is developed into pamphlets or consent forms in general to ensure that the average NICU parent will understand exactly what is being asked of them and what will happen to their baby. I think NICU graduate parents can also be a part of the team that approach the parents when explaining the research and asking for consent. You know, a family advocate model is used by many hospitals and school systems for various meetings when a family will under, you know, be under duress or, or feel stressed and possibly not understand what's going on or being asked of them. And I think that family advocate model can be used in the hospitals and it can bridge that gap in understanding. And it can be applied to you know, critical care conversations and research trials as well. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe other people can ask you to expand on their favorite parts of that. But for now, I'd like to move to a question from Jerry Bear. And Jerry has asked, using the Q&A facility that is illustrated on the screen, uh, Jerry's question is, what type of communication tools are being considered as part of this working group's objectives? 
maybe we can go around the panel, perhaps starting with Christina and then Jennifer. But Christina, what are your views on communication tools that are being developed? Yeah, so, so thank you for the question, Jerry. And so in the communications work group so far, we've only just kicked off this process. So we started with the brainstorming activity, as I mentioned in the presentation, and it runs the gamut from uh, working through existing advocacy groups to develop uh, tools on what is neonatal research, all the way to thinking about the existing um, educational programs that are in place to develop the nurses and neonatal nurses of the future and the neonatal fellows uh, that are in the units as we speak. So it's a very broad range of things that came into the discussion. Um, I think Mary and Kelly will be probably the best ones to speak to how they may have had some very preliminary thinking about how they'll further take the communications work group forward to hone and think uh, about uh, the, the stepwise process they may take to ultimately come to the determination on what tools should be further developed. But we've only really begun these discussions, Jerry. So um, it's a great opportunity for those of you who've been a part of that type of process before to now jump in and, uh, and supplement our work group in order to be able to advance that discussion. So. Um, Mark, I think Kelly and Mary might be well suited to jump in there. Well, yeah, I, I, I've always wanted to turn to the families first. So, Jennifer, do you have any quick comments on on the topic of communication tools? You know, like Christina said, we've just been able to provide this information from these three perspectives, and we haven't quite gotten to what could happen yet. But I will say, from my perspective. I would like the parents to be involved in you know, every aspect of it, down to developing the survey, the language, and the consent process, and of course, have more access to results at the end of trial. But I think that Kelly and Mary can add quite a bit to this. Great. So thank you. So Mary, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> so we're looking for partnership with our um, INC members um, once they have had the opportunity both through the webinar and the um, manuscripts um, to share what insights that um, drove uh, their understanding from the results to help us prioritize um, what we've already brainstormed and what to, to move forward. And uh, totally agree that uh, things that are developed for parents or for any part of the neonatal community need to have all stakeholders involved. Thank you. Kelly? Yeah, I would uh, support everything that was said, but just add that really as we're writing all of these papers, which are going to be, you know, likely wrapped up as we end the year uh, going through further review, I think the first piece that can happen quickly is encouraging investigators and researchers in units to include the nurses and parents in discussions. Um, and even things such as, you know, the next trial that you open in a NICU, have you asked the nurses uh, their suggestions or ideas about implementing that trial or where the nurses role, do what suggestions they have for collecting samples or different things that are actually nurse-driven practices. So all the papers, um, I think are going to highlight this need for investigators to begin to include uh, nurses and families in their implementation and research review process. I think the other thing is really to partner with uh, nursing organizations and parent organizations to get more information about best practices when it comes to research results disclosure. Um, I really think that's a key area, but we don't see doing this in isolation. We see this as doing this as partners, both within other groups of the INC. Uh, perhaps this, uh, some of these communication issues can be part of our master protocols to include areas of research disclosure, uh, and then work with our partner organizations, uh, particularly nurses and families, about how to create these communication or improve these communication processes. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, as you're talking, I wonder whether part of the communication process needs to be towards policymakers so that ethics committees or IRBs or funders or regulators need to start slipping these messages in so there's kind of a top-down approach as well as a participatory bottom-up approach that, that Kelly's mentioned. So um, we can leave that hanging in the air, but I think there's, there's many different people who can influence practice in this in this regard. I think Jerry's got a, um, a follow-up question about next steps, and that was about whether there's a role for a deeper dive into qualitative research with parents about the best ways to approach, discuss, and educate the parents, both as potential educators, but as also potential recipients of, of educational material. So formal qualitative research, are there plans for that? Mary or Kelly? So this is Mary. Again, we haven't gotten into that specific level of detail about what's next, but I do believe that there are efforts um, related to that ongoing about um, patient advocates in general, parents, um, for all types of... Ma Mary, I'm very sorry, but... We need to we're having, a we're having trouble to... And how to meet their needs and how to help them be um, advocate for research needs for their children. So I think one of the things that I hope that we'll look at is how we might partner with other efforts going on and making sure that the knee and night is not left out in those efforts. Thank you, Mary. I think your microphone was a little bit difficult to hear. Um, but I think we, we caught the main points of your intervention. Kelly. Yeah, so we haven't, um, we're so focused on writing these papers right now that we haven't polled the communication group to determine the highest priority uh, for moving forward. So we need to prioritize. There's so many different ways we could go. Uh, and that prioritization is scheduled to occur uh, in the beginning of the new year. But certainly, um, it would not surprise me if more qualitative research on parent attitudes uh, towards NICU research or research disclosure uh, could certainly be a high priority item uh, moving forward for this group. But again, we have not asked the group yet to prioritize the next step. And again, I don't know if this would be exclusive to the INC or could also imagine it being in partnership with uh, parent groups. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my experience of qualitative research is that to do it properly takes a lot of time and it needs experienced people to do the interviews and to do the analyses. So one of the constraints on that prioritization may be whether we have the expertise within the group and the availability of that expertise or whether there's any resource that could be deployed to to bring that time and, and expertise in. But uh, I, I think there's um, a lot of important work that could be done. And uh, in terms of important work, uh, there's a question from Sunaseo, uh, who is asking about, are there any existing or published similar survey results from other comparative disease or population areas, such as pediatric oncology, where research protocols are such an integral part of patient treatment. So I wonder if we're beginning to get a hint of extrapolation from one source community into another target community um, by extrapolating from survey results as well as, as data. But um, who would like to go first about any existing or published similar survey results? Christina, I think you mentioned that there was a, an informal literature review did that cover uh, similar topics in other therapeutic areas? So th thank you, Mark. So when we conducted our literature review, we tried to target um, pediatric literature in an ICU setting. Um, and so we did look specifically for neonatal intensive care units. What we found is that there was no literature out there that supported that this um, parallel stakeholder type of method had been conducted across nurses, physicians, and parents. 
Um, there were certainly physician and uh, parent surveys, and there was nurse surveys and nurse and parent surveys, so we didn't find it specifically in the neonatal space. There was some literature that we saw um, within pediatric intensive care units, um, but we did not extend our informal lit search much beyond those communities. Um, so I do think that certainly it serves as a potential opportunity for there to be a more formalized uh, assessment of those um, literature databases that are out there for us to potentially tap into and assess whether or not there may be any relevant learnings there that could be applied for the neonatal space. Great. Thank you very much. And and soon as sent a follow-up comment, uh, which is to think about the communication tools in the same way, and maybe part of thinking about future communication tools could be looking for similar work that's been done in other other spaces that would perhaps speed up the development of of neonatal communication tools because there are going to be some generic principles that that could be applied. So maybe that's another piece of the of the jigsaw. For prioritization. So, so thank you very much to Jerry and to Suna uh, for those questions. Please keep the questions coming in. The um, facility is shown on the screen. The, the next question um, for Jenny, I think, is, is this pinning down a little bit more about how hospitals or whoever's doing the education can um, educate families about research and clinical trials, and particularly how can they focus on minimizing the confusion surrounding the need for research and the safeguards in place during trials? Jennifer, do you have any, any comment on that? I do. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm going to piggyback on what I believe Kelly said earlier, is I think that if the research teams and the physicians can develop some kind of family-friendly, frequently asked questions or pamphlets, regarding a trial in general and really bring in the NICU graduate parent, <clears throat> I'm sorry, organizations, um, such as the NICU Parent Network, which is formerly the Premier Parent Alliance. I know that EFCNI has a big presence over in Europe, and there's also the Irish Neonatal Health Alliance, but any, any organization would really be able to uh, provide some valuable feedback as to language in discussions and any literature that gets put out there. Um, and I also think upon admission to the NICU in a level three or four unit, I think the parents should be spoken to, and maybe it's the case in some but not all, um, spoken to about the possibility of being approached to have their baby in a clinical trial. And I think that would take away a lot of the surprise when the parent is approached initially if they knew it could possibly happen. And at that point, I think it would be a good time to discuss why research is important and you know what research has given us so far as far as uh, medical developments in the neonatal space, and not just why research needs to be done, but when they are approached, I think they really need to be addressed as why research has to be done on their baby, you know, specifically, what is going on there, and how it could benefit their baby or, or future babies. And I think the more conversation and education put out there, I think we could really make some progress in the in the communication. Thank you very much. Carol, I wonder from your perspective as an educator and a nurse and a thought leader, how, how would you respond to the, the thought about improving education for families about research on the neonatal unit? Thank you, Mark. I, I think, um, again, it fits so well with the fact that we are moving more and more to integrated family-centered care and an approach and that many units are including parents not only in rounding but in really, um, dial I guess, dialoguing with the health professionals about the plans of care, including transition to home. Um, and so I, I think as we have more of the information that has come like from this survey and other areas, um, we can have identified some key areas that either if there is a, um, a educator on the unit, some units still have that, or for example, IRBs sometimes will do education. I know our IRB does just around the research process, that that is a way 
um, forward if, if that's available. I think also for nurses, and this is what we do in academic institutions as well, I do it with new faculty that have no research experience, getting them in a dialogue with the researchers, getting them to sit in on the beginning of research projects so they understand the research process and um, also so they'll speak up because it is the nurse usually that has the uh, ability to spend more time with the families and may know um, how better to approach a family about a consent process. So having them in those staff meetings or in those situations where they can learn from each other I think is also very helpful and because it's, it's an environment that is um, safe environment to ask questions because you're you're growing and you're you can admit that you don't know know everything about that and and I also uh, want to make a comment um, and it has to do with uh, learning from other best practices again because my own research is focused on transition from hospital to home I learned very early from parents because this was not my perception that many of our standardized um, communication tools, especially around discharge, are viewed by parents as not meeting their needs and yet they see that we are mandated to check off those boxes and to do the things that we have to have in the chart to say that they learned CPR, et cetera. But to dialogue with the parents about what they really need to feel comfortable in going home, I think it also translates to your question to me, Mark, about are we asking the nurses and the parents, well, we did in this survey, but in a broader context, what do you need in order to feel comfortable about the research process, again, from the beginning of a project all the way to the dissemination? Thank you very much. Uh, so the, I think the idea of using other specialties to inform um, the, the work in the future has struck a chord among the attendees. For example, Nicola Obama has asked, did the group come across any literature describing the use of trial-specific videos as an adjunct to current processes for broadly improving the communication and education surrounding neonatal trials for both staff and families? Has anyone come across any videos or any literature about that? Uh, so I can, I can start, yeah, I can start, and then um, Jennifer and Mary certainly join in since you, you both participated in the informal literature review, and Carol, you did too. Um, so when we did search the literature, there were a couple of papers that did discuss videos. Um, whether or not they fell into the uh, informal lit review that was conducted by the nurse lit review group and the parents, I do not know, I have to be honest with you. There certainly is literature that is out there about the use of videos for, um, for pediatric interventions, so there is a source of information out there that could be tapped into to better inform. Um, and in fact, there are um, research, uh, there are videos that have been developed about what it is research for families and children um, in some of the different INC regions by uh, bodies. For example, in the United States, we, we have uh, uh, that, um, that information that's been developed through the NIH. There's also information that's developed through the March of Dimes. So that information is available for us to think about reviewing and tapping into for its applicability to the neonatal population and the neonatal intensive care unit. But in terms of the lit reviews we came across, I don't recall that they actually ended up being pulled into the informal lit search. So Mary, Carol, Jennifer, I don't know if um, there's anything you want to add from those that you had reviewed. So this is Mary. Can you hear me more clearly now? Yes. Sure. Um, so no, I in the review that I participated in, there was not anything specific to use in the NICU. And I would agree with Christina that other groups have worked to make videos explaining clinical trials and safety precautions in clinical trials. And I think when I was um, muffled conversation previously, that's what I was um, indicating that I think uh, one of the goals of our communication group is to look at other efforts 
um, that are addressing this issue and make sure that the neonatal population is not left out and look for how we can partner with them in order to, to make sure all pediatric populations are covered with this information. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel? I have seen this done. Um, a couple of industry-sponsored studies have given our unit um, so iPads with videos or cartoons on them about their specific trials to give the families a bit more background than um, might happen anyway. Uh, I don't know whether those companies have written that experience up, but, but there has been some, some experience. And um, in the UK, at least, we're quite used to having video training on how to take consent. And some of the trials will employ actors and bring all the investigators together from multiple sites to go through the consent process um, with parents and with actors playing parents to, to use video in that sense. But there's certainly some experience with video specific for trials aimed at parents. It's just maybe not been, been reported yet. Um, now, Suna has, has another Mark. question. Please, yeah. Um, uh, it's Kelly. I, I would just add that another advantage of a video format, you know, I d did not do that specific literature uh, review to see if families report their qualitative experience more positively after receiving a video format of research information. So I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that the video format as an adjunct to receiving information about research would also help us uh, include nurses um, as part of the people who are describing research and include parents as part of the people who are describing research and make sure that that messaging is consistent across all units. And a video explaining the trial is also a nice way to bring information about the research to all the different care providers in the unit who are not typically present when we are approaching a family for consent. So a video can perhaps um, enhance the communication to families that also I think would serve a great value in making sure all the providers are more familiar with what the research is that's going on and why. Great, thank you very much. Any, any other comments? Okay, so let's move on to, to Suna's next question, which is, could you expand on any subgroup analyses performed based on demographic data? For example, were any differences seen for race or ethnicity groups? I guess yeah. Christina or Mary could comment. Sure. Um, so thank you. That is one of the areas where we would like to do more work. Um, but just to talk a little bit about the tool that we use, since I did not do that in the context of the presentation and its limitations. So we did utilize a tool called SurveyMonkey, which many of you may have exposure to. SurveyMonkey, aside from being able to do some very simple survey style questions, can do a bit more of complex um, survey analysis, but we used the data analytics feature that was in the SurveyMonkey tool. So it becomes a little bit more complex to be able to link data points across the population. It will require actually more manual assessment for each of the individual respondents' data. So for purposes of the work that we've done up to this point, uh, in order to have the uh, webinar and the results presentation, we've focused on the primary results analysis and have not conducted any subpopulation analysis. And then the other thing that I would note is we've talked actually quite a bit in our communications work group, and certainly um, Kelly, Carol, and Jennifer can speak to this a bit too from their perspective. And We've all cautioned a bit about doing too much subgroup analysis because, as highlighted at the very beginning of the results presentation, these populations are small, so suddenly they become very small when we start doing too much uh, subgroup analysis. Our largest cohort, the nursing cohort, probably would be the cohort where we would be able to 
potentially have more interpretable subgroup analysis, but both the physician and parent uh, cohorts were smaller and therefore could make such a, a, uh, an analysis, uh, render it uh, not really possible. So I'm not sure, Kelly, Carol, Jennifer, if you wanted to add anything there from what your individual stakeholder groups have been talking about when you've looked at the data for the, for the individual papers. This is Carol. I agree with what you said, Christina. I mean, I think even though that the nurses did have a larger population of respondents, it's still in this particular survey, I'm not certain how useful it would be if we tried to drill down at this point, but it certainly is something that we could, should consider um, for future. Yes, Kelly, um, I, I agree. I think the, the numbers just get too small, particularly as with all surveys. As you walk through the survey, you do, we do see attrition in the number of responses. And I think we would have needed to specifically design the survey um, with subgroup analysis in mind as part of the statistical plan and then have had a mission to more broadly disseminate um, to get more responses. Um, but again, I can't, I think for this survey results, it'd be very, very challenging um, to do subgroup analysis, but I wouldn't take it off the list for future survey work with that intent in mind. Thank you very much. Any, any comments from the panel? Um, actually, okay, so I'll, I'll add something. Can I, can I just add something there? Because I know it came up in the evening webinar, and I think it's certainly something that we've all thought of as an opportunity for the future for the communications work group and, and ways that we may have the opportunity to generate more data. Again, recall that we did note that one of the limitations that this survey was developed um, in the English language. There, there are a host of reasons for that. We had a lot of long and hard debate over whether or not there would be potential to develop the survey in multiple languages, and we were, frankly, resource constrained, and that was one of our limitations. Um, however, we do believe that there would be the potential for this survey to be reproduced. Um, uh, if it goes through translation control in other languages, it would help to broaden the population um, and therefore potentially allow for any future planned analysis between, um, between cohorts. Um, we note also, too, that our survey did not restrict the ability for anyone to take the survey. So we didn't ask the question if English is your um, native language because this was a survey that was a, um, um, a survey of our INC membership and their networks. And we did acknowledge that our meetings and the way we communicate within the INC communicate, uh, community is through the English language, um, so that was the reason we ultimately ended up. So I think that there is certainly opportunity in the future. Um, the survey design, all the individual-based surveys are all available for that potential application in the future. Great, thank you very much. And um, I just see there's a note from Makako, who cites work done by French colleagues with the European Foundation for the Care of the Newborn Infant, EFCNI, and Rococo points out that their work from 2018 did not use video, but highlighted the point that families really valued um, the FaceTime. So the paper, Nero et al., uh, Clinical Trials in Neonates, How to Optimize Informed Consent and Decision Making. And I know that other people are, are conducting, there's a couple of PhD research students I've heard about doing this. So this is a growing field, and I think the survey will um, help inform all these people as they refine their methodologies, and the survey and its results are currently a call to action that we can all begin to meet um, within our, our setting. And um, so the 
Thank you very much. So I think we've got time for one more question. And unless something comes in from the attendees, uh, we'll go back to a, a zinger that we had last time from Bob Ward. And um, that was a question from Bob to Jennifer with comments welcome from everybody else. How would parents prefer, prefer to learn about research in the neonatal unit during a time of stress? So Jennifer, what were your reflections on Bob's question about consent at a time of stress? You know, that, that's a great question, but as I said the other day, it's a bit challenging because everybody responds differently to trauma or stress. So for me, I hear some noise on the line, that's not me. Um, I think it's very individual and I think it would be quite beneficial to speak to the parent if possible, um, upon admission to the NICU, if there's not already, um, I mean, of course, there's stress going on already, but if there's not something critical at the moment, and see their perception of how they want to handle situations. And some parents prefer, like I did, to know everything up front and will do research and wants to know what could happen, what are the possible complications of every single step along the way. And there are a lot of parents that don't really want to operate that way, and they would prefer just to know as something comes along so they're not fearful. So I really do believe that's an individual question that you'd have to ask parents, and perhaps that opens up another um, possible survey for somebody in the future to poll parents to really see what the most common response is to that. Yeah, that does sound like a really good framework for a qualitative study. There's the beginnings of a theory there that, that could be expanded upon or tested um, in in interviews or focus groups as well as as well as surveys. So thank you very much for that for that guidance. So unless there are any other questions or comments from from the um, from the attendees, uh, we can begin to close. And I think the first this part of closing Mark, the meeting is, is this. Please, Mary. Mark, this is Mary Short. I was going to make one other comment in relation to that. And um, again, this is my personal perspective um, from working as a neonatal nurse for uh, about 24 years and then doing a midlife career change into industry and being there now for a long time as well. One of the things that concerns me and why I think we need a culture change is that um, I think we, better, we need to better communicate the important role of research and the fact that in our neonates, um, we still have some um, large unmet medical needs in, to improve outcomes and how important research is to be able to improve outcomes for those babies. And that if we set that stage, then maybe um, sharing uh, information with parents about potential research will become easier across the board. So thank you for letting me make that comment. Well, thank you. Um, so. I think we're coming to the end of, of our time, so we need to be very grateful to Christina for presenting, but she was put on a very nice platform by Jennifer and Mary and the other members of the working group who had um, spent a lot of time designing the survey, administering it, and then analyzing it. I know there's been a lot of care and a lot of attention gone into the analysis so that it is relevant and it does fit the data very nicely, and there's been an enormous amount of work to um, to build the, um, the papers. I think discussion today has been extremely helpful because it's given some pointers that the group can consider as they prioritize their next steps. It's enriched the ideas that are available um, by bringing in different perspectives. And it's given us a chance to, to reflect on the lessons that we've had and how to present them to multiple groups in future. I guess a final comment is to say thank you to Laura and Sarah from, from CPATH for organizing this webinar under some fairly difficult circumstances with um, various users and various providers that have, um, haven't always lived up to their expectations. So um, thank you very much to Laura and to Sarah. And, um, and we can close the meeting now. Please follow up with, um, with Mary and with Kelly if you have any further points, and if, particularly if you want to be part of this very productive group that is contributing to that culture change that, that, that we all need so much. So please contribute, 
And um, thank you very much to the presenters, the panel, and the attendees. And I look forward, we all look forward to further discussions within INT. Thank you very much.